and welcome to Church of Celebration Online. We hope you're excited to worship with us. We're also excited that we will be gathering in person again on Sunday, August 23rd at 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Our online services will stay the same if you choose not to join us in person just yet. For more details and guidelines for in-person gathering, please visit our website at churchofcelebration.com. If today is your first time at COC, we want you to know that we're so happy you're here. Text the word HELLO to 520-201-2444 so we can send you a special digital gift. Celebrators, your faithful generosity is making an impact on our community. If you would like to join in on things COC is doing in our own backyards and around the world, text GIVE to 520-201-2444 now. Also, text COC to 520-201-2444 to become a part of our new text alerts so you can always be in the loop. Let's worship together. What's up, COC Online? Thank you so much for joining us today. Let's get up and worship. Yeah, come on.
Our God is the God of the impossible things, and we're going to worship him. Yes, he does amazing things in our lives, and we're going to worship him. Yeah, come on.
I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. God, thank you so much for this time of worship today. God, we pray for breakthrough. We pray for chains to be broken. God, we are your children. We're not holding on to the fear. God, I pray that blind will see. I pray that the lame will walk. I pray that changed lives happen now. Jesus, open up our ears and open up our hearts to really hear from you today. God, I pray that you will change us from the inside out. God, please use, use us in a mighty way. Use us in a mighty way to declare your kingdom here on earth. Thank you, Lord, for this time today. Speak to us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Come on, girl. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Church of Celebration. Now let's get ready to worship. In bringing to you a brand new series called... Uh, uh. <laughs> I just wanted to invite those of you who are newer to COC to meet the pasties on May 17th. <laughs> Um...
Are we recording already? Stop. I just sang the wrong words. We're gonna try that again. Dave works, sorry. <laughs> Should I keep going? All right. Which one was it that you wanted us unison and then parts? What are you talking about? I see a red light. I've got kind of an obnoxious voice, so I... <laughs> no, listen Let to it. Or leave it hold the on. only hold way. On, hold on, hold on. Yeah? Hold that. No! What has happened? Guy. Yeah, someone just called and it stopped it. Welcome to Church of Celebration Online. It is so good to see you today. And if you're a guest tuning in today, man, thank you so much for joining us today on COC Live Online. Man, it is great to be with you. I guess I should start by saying I'm alive. And uh, as you can see in the flesh, um, I want to personally say thank you to all of you who prayed for me in uh, the process of healing my heart, as well as in addition to prayers for my family. Um, we felt them and we are grateful for you. And I'm excited to be with you guys today and share with you a little bit of a one hit wonder that I believe we all need to be reminded of today. So let's just jump in. As a pastor, I am asked many, many questions and have been throughout my life, but there's one that comes quite regular, and that question goes and sounds a little like this. How do you know that you are saved? How do you know you've been saved? And without hesitation, my answer to that question all the time has been, well, I was there when it happened. I was there when it happened. The most radical change that can come upon anyone is the change created by new birth. The Bible tells us when a person comes to Christ, it says that all things become new. That's found in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Basically, they pass from death to life, from darkness to light. And that experience is what we call in the Christian world Salvation. And it happens to different people in various and different ways. In Acts chapter 9, the Apostle Paul, who wrote about two thirds of our New Testament, he was struck to the ground by a blinding light, and it happened in an instant. In Acts chapter 16, Lydia was converted uh, in a quiet riverside prayer meeting. In Matthew chapter 4, Peter and Andrew, they were just fishing. They were fishing and then they were asked, would you like to become fishers of men? My point is it can happen in a numerous amount of ways. The most important thing is this, that you know that it happened, that you know it happened. And then when you know it happened, you take ownership of it. And when you take ownership of it, then you realize then that you have a love worth sharing. And that's what we really want to talk about today. So let me ask you today, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you're a born again believer in Jesus, uh, you call yourself a Christian. Let me ask you personally, do, do you know what your moment looked like? What, what, uh, uh, do you know specifically when it happened? And then, more importantly to that question is, is this, what, what have you been doing with that moment since that moment? That's a question that all followers of Jesus need to consider and process as they strive to live out their lives for Jesus Christ. So as you're thinking about that this morning, let me follow that thought up with this question. 
What if I told you today that your story, your moment, your sharing of your moment and your story was all it took to change someone else's life forever? What if I told you that your story could become someone else's story if you're willing to share your story? As you resonate on that throughout this message, I want to share with you a powerful, powerful story. One of my favorites in all of scripture. And it's found in John chapter 9. If you got your Bibles, you can go there right now. But I want to tell you a little bit about this. It's, it's, a, it's a story where Jesus shares his story. Uh, and he invites another man into his story. And then we're going to see how that man, he's known as the blind man, begins to then share his story unabashedly, unashamedly, whether he felt qualified to do so or not. To give you a little back history, there's a blind man and he wakes up one morning and that morning starts like hundreds of mornings before. However, there's one thing that he's unaware of about this morning. This day is actually going to be like no other day in his life. And his world's about to change because he's about ready to meet Jesus. I'm going to read this story for you first, so I hope you have your Bibles out or you can follow along on the screens. But I'm going to read this story for you, and then we're going to kind of break it down a little bit in some passages. In John chapter 9, verses 1 through 34, Jesus is about to invite this man into his story. As he went along, Jesus, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, here's what Jesus did. He spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes and then said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and came home seeing his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some of them claimed that he was, and others said, no, he only just looks like that man. But he himself insisted, I am that man. And then they asked, how then were your eyes opened? And he replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go wash him off in the pools of Siloam. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Then they asked, where is this man? He goes, I don't know. And now it gets a little complicated because the Pharisees, the religious leaders, begin to investi investigate this healing. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Verse 14, if you're still following. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He replied, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he doesn't even keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were kind of divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes that he opened. And the man replied, he's a prophet. The Jews still did not believe him that he had been born or that he'd been blind and received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. And then they asked, is this your son? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered. And we know he was born blind. But how he can see or who opened his eyes? We don't know. Now get this. They say, ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For already the Jews had decided that anybody who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said he's of age. Ask him. So a second time they summoned the man who had been blind and they said, give glory to God. 
We know this man is a sinner. And he replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know is this. I was born blind and now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are the fellow's disciple. We are the disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. And then the man answered, now this is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opens eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't do anything. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Now, let me break this story down for you a little bit, step by step, so you can understand what's going on here. Let's start where the very first verse begins. And it says, as he, Jesus, went along, he saw a man blind from birth. Now, what you need to know about this guy who was blind from birth was this. There was basically one job that somebody born blind had from birth until he, he, he died. And the only job for a man born blind was that of a beggar. See, in this culture and this time, if you were born blind, that's just what you did. You, you were a beggar. So Jesus, being compassionate the way that Jesus was, was walking along and he sees a blind man begging. And then the disciples asked this question, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. Now picture this. Jesus is walking through the town. Everywhere around him are people because anywhere Jesus went, people followed. There's a massive crowd. Jesus evidently stops because he sees a blind man begging and he stops the whole parade and he addresses the issue. As they stop, Jesus looks at this man and his disciples ask him this question. Was he born blind because of his sin, Jesus, or because of his parents' sin? Now, what you need to understand as to why they asked that question is, once again, in culture, in that time, there was a tradition, a teaching that kind of went like this in the Jewish culture. If you had some form of deformity, uh, you had a shorter arm or you had a limp in your walk or you were born blind, something was messed up with you, whatever it was, it was viewed, spiritually speaking, as punishment for either your sin or your parents' sin. That's, that's why you're different. That's why you're different. This was just a Jewish belief. So Jesus replies to this question from his disciples, and he says, neither this man nor his parents' sin. But this happened for one reason and one reason alone. So that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Basically what Jesus was saying as he answers the question from his disciples is, come on guys, are you kidding me? I'm not going to get caught up in this dumb conversation and discussion again as to whether it was him that sinned or his parents that sinned. I'm telling you right now, listen to me clearly, let, read my lips. It's neither. That's not the reason that this man was born blind. This guy was born blind for one reason. So the power of God could be shown in his life. So I could share my story of light of the world to this man who's been in darkness. And it's right here that Jesus sets the stage for an incredible miracle that's right on the verge of taking place. Now, before we go there, I want you to think about the magnitude of this whole concept real quick. 
I want you to close your eyes at home right now. And I want you to squeeze them tightly. I don't want you to look at me, watch me. I want you just to hear my words as they come through your screens. Imagine yourself, imagine yourself going about your normal daily routine. Eyes closed. I can see some of you squinting and, and peeking. Eyes closed. Imagine going through your normal routine this way every day. The alarm goes off. Your sudden blindness doesn't prevent you from hitting the snooze button because you've been doing that in the dark as long as you can remember. Okay, so you've made it through step one. So you get yourself out of bed. Again, keep your eyes closed. You can't see anything. Just go through your morning routine. You go to the dresser or the closet and you pick out your clothes for the day. But since you can't see, you can't tell the color of the clothes that you picked out. For some of you, that would be an improvement. You go to the kitchen to get your morning stimulant, your hot java. You go through the routine in your mind. You can see it with your eyes closed right now. You can, you can see what you're doing and have done every morning, but you're just duplicating it in your mind because of muscle memory minus the sight. And suddenly, as you go through everything in your morning to routine, you, you're, you're suddenly realizing that it doesn't appear to be quite as easy as you probably were thinking. But now you go to your car and you're getting ready for your morning commute, just like any other day. But today, if you start that car up and you attempt to drive with no sight, you are going to cause serious damage. Moms, your husband leaves for work. You don't work. You stay at home. You begin your daily schedule, your daily routine. You begin vacuuming. You can't see anything. You're blind. You hear a screech and you wonder, did I just vacuum up the cat? Your day goes on. You proceed through your day with no sight, no vision. Everything that you can see playing out is all based on muscle memory. But remember, you were born blind, so you don't even have muscle memory outside of what you practice while being blind. Dinner comes naturally that night. Everybody tastes your meal and wonders why it tastes a little funny. And now your husband has the right to say what he may think sometimes. Did you make this blindfolded? <laughs> now you can open your eyes. Open them up. Let your eyes adjust to the light once again. Here's my point. You and I, we often take for granted our gift of sight. But this guy, he's always, always, his entire life, as far back as his memories can go, has been dependent on a friendly arm or kindness that someone may show to lead him around and take him places. And now, Jesus is just about to heal him and change his life dramatically by not only giving him physical sight, but also spiritual sight. The Bible continues with our story and says something very peculiar and kind of hilarious in verse 6. And it says, having said this, he, Jesus, spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Now, now to me, I think that's kind of strange and I think it's kind of humorous. Uh, a way to heal somebody. We're talking about the Son of God, of all the ways that Jesus could heal this guy. This is how Jesus chooses to do it. I don't know why, but my, my mind thinks that's interesting. And he's talking to this blind man. He spits on the ground and he takes the saliva and he basically makes a mud pie. A mud pie. And he puts it on his eyes and he tells the blind man, go wash it off. Now, you can probably think what this blind guy is thinking right now. Close your eyes again. Close your eyes again. Tight. Nobody's looking. No looking around. Listen to this. You hear that? With your eyes closed? You know what you're probably thinking? You're probably thinking, where did that just go? But remember, you grew up blind. People have been picking on you. Your whole life, you're second rate. You're permanently an outcast. 
you're thinking, oh my gosh, what I just heard doesn't sound very good. What's going to happen next? Oh, great. Here we go. Another public humiliation embarrassment. You can open your eyes again. However, Jesus doesn't do what always been, has been done to this guy. He makes a mud concoction, he puts it on his eyes, and he says, go wash it off. And once again, when I hear these words, I just kind of chuckle again, forgive me, pray for Ginger, because she has to live with me. This is the way my, my brain works. But when Jesus says, go wash it off, I'm sitting here thinking, yeah, that would probably be the appropriate thing to say right here. Go wash it off because I just loogied in your face. But seriously, though, I do wonder sometimes, the Bible doesn't tell us clearly, but I wonder how this blind guy from birth felt after that. I'm betting he was probably feeling a little foolish, maybe even a little embarrassed, may, maybe even a little curious of to what is going on. Or maybe, maybe he thought this. I have heard many, many things about this man named Jesus. I sensed something in his voice. I even sensed something in the touch of his hands to my eyes. And maybe as he's walking to the pools, he's thinking, what if this is true? What if there's a possibility that I could actually receive my sight? And I want you just to imagine here for a moment. Get into this story. Let the pages come alive. And I want you just to think about what, what happened in this moment as he kneels down by the pool and he begins to wash off of his eyes. Out of nowhere, his eyes, his eyes start doing some things that are just not normal, not, not right. And, and through the darkness that, that, that's all he's ever known, he, he, he begins to see Something, something begins to form in, in his sight. And he thinks, I is that light? Is that light? I don't know because I don't know what light is. It's just something that I know that, is, that has never happened before. And then he starts to think, could, could it be? Could it really, really be? Could it be that I am receiving my sight? And then all of a sudden as the mud is washed off of his faith, he begins to actually see something else. He, he looks he looks up into the bright sky and he sees the color blue and he's like, oh my gosh, is that the sky? Is that the sky? It looks, it looks like I don't know anything I've ever seen, but I see and I hear people say that the sky is blue. Is that, is that blue? Is that blue? And then he looks around and he sees a tree and he knows that people have always said the trees are green. And he's like, oh my gosh, is, is, that, is that the color green? Oh my gosh, it's true. It's true about what they say about this man. I can see, I can see. Can you just imagine? Get into this story. Understand the miraculous transformation that has taken place in this man's life instantaneously. Now check out what happens next. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that's him. But others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself said, no, 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 I am that man. Oh my gosh, this is crazy. He now has to defend himself and he's saying, it's really me. It's really me. I'm the dude that's been tripping over your dogs since birth. I'm the guy that you've used my back to unroll your scrolls as a platform table. That's me. But now I can see I am that same man. So they ask, how then were your eyes open? He replied, the man they call Jesus made some mud and put him on my eyes. And he said, go to Salome. And wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. And they said, where is this man? They asked him. He said, I don't know. I don't know. Then it says they brought to the Pharisees the man that had been born blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was Sabbath. Now the Sabbath, if you're unfamiliar with the Bible, was a day 
that the law said you could do no work on. So now the religious re uh, leaders, they don't even really care about the man that's been born blind. They're upset because he was healed and Jesus did it, of all people, healed him on the Sabbath. Go figure. The Pharisees are ticked about something that Jesus did. Verse 15, therefore the Pharisees also asked him, how did he receive his sight? And he said, here's what happened. He put mud on my eyes and I washed and now I see. And some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. The Bible continues in verse 17 and it says, finally they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes that he opened, and the man replied, I, I, he's a prophet? Now here's what's going on here. The religious leaders didn't like Jesus because he taught differently than them. He taught more about the love of God, not about the law of God. He taught more about relationship as opposed to keeping God's rules. So the passage continues in verse 18 the Jews still did not believe that he had been born blind or that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents this 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 is this is mind blowing right here here's this guy standing before them telling them i can see i was born blind people have already testified that this was who i am and now i can see and i'm telling you this guy is who did it he's telling now his story his story, and they, they, they basically reply with, no, 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 no. We don't believe you because, because uh, that would mean that Jesus actually really is something special. We don't believe you because that would mean that Jesus is God because he has the capability of healing. Would somebody please, would somebody please go get his mom and dad for us? Let's clear this up. So the parents are called in, verse 19, and they asked, is this your son? Is this the one you say were, was born blind? How is it that now he can see? And they say, we know he is our son, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes? You got us. We really don't know. Ask him. Ask him, because he's of age. He's old enough to speak for himself. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? This is ridiculous. So they call this guy back in a second time, getting a little bit more aggravated because they're not getting the answers that they want to their questions. And here's what they say. A second time they summoned the man who had been born or had been blind. And they said, give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. Now, seriously, friends, seriously. <laughs> if I'm this blind guy and all of this is happening, I'm sitting here thinking, is this a circus show? This is ridiculous. They don't want my answer because they don't like my answer. They want me to say something that I'm not going to say because I'm going to tell them the truth. But just listen to this guy's response to this question. Probably one of the greatest lines to me in the entire Bible. And for all of you that are listening today and watching who may fear or get a little nervous to share your story, your moment where your life changed because you may not know that much about the Bible, here's your sign. You have no excuse anymore. Listen to this guy's response. He replied, whether this guy, Jesus, is a sinner or not, I, I, I don't know that. There is one thing for sure, 100% certain guaranteed, and it's this. This morning I woke up blind like I have my entire life. I've never had sight. I've never been able to see. I know this without a doubt. I was blind. But right now, sure as you are sitting and standing in front of me, I can see every single one of you. I was blind. But now I see. And there it is, celebrators. There it is. Don't miss this today. The blind man received his sight. He owned his story. And without shame or fear, he shared 
his story. What an incredible way. What an incredible way to witness when you don't have all the answers. When you don't think you have anything to say, anything cute or clever to convince somebody that's challenging you in your faith. Basically, he said this in modern day language. Listen, I, I, I don't know much. I'm not very well versed. I don't even know where John 3.16 is. I don't have all the answers to evolution, to science, to Muhammad, to Buddha, to Joseph Smith. I don't know much. But there's one thing I do know. I know this. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once could only see darkness, but now all I see is light. Can somebody please, please, man, I, this is where I miss you in person right now. Could you please type in, amen, praise the Lord, yes, 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 because this is so powerful. This is so powerful. This is what some of you that are listening today need to hear. You need to get. Now watch what happens next. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? The blind guy says, I love this. This is just absolutely classic. He says, I've told you already and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? I love this. Ready? Do you want to become his disciples too? Huh? I love this. I totally love that comment. What a sarcastic and snarky way to answer them. This dude is a man after my own heart. Seriously. Then, he, then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow dis disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as his, for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. They get all huffy puffy. They get all mad, and arms crossed, just mad, ticked off. And they say, you, we know more than you. We know more than you. Look at us. You, you don't know anything. You're, you're an idiot. You're an idiot. Then this blind man, who already has discovered in a short time of meeting Jesus, realizes that God never does anything amazing without a purpose, says something awesome. He now, who doesn't know the scriptures like the Pharisees do, he now lectures the religious on what they know best, religion. And he says this, interesting. This is remarkable, he says. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. I'm like, a, I'm like a living, breathing miracle right in front of you. There's proof. There's guarantee. I got testimonies. And he says, we all, we, we don't have to be special like you. We all know, we all know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man. Who does his will? And here we go. Ready? He says, nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. He's like, I, I got the story that trumps all stories right now. Nobody has ever heard of what happened to me, but it happened. In essence, he's like, are you, are you guys kidding me? How can this man not be from God? How can he not be from God? And then he goes on and says, if this man were not from God, I'll tell you this, he wouldn't be able to do anything. In essence, he's saying, you religious guys, you're supposed to be so close to God. And I'm here telling you, he healed me and you don't know anything about him. Seriously, you, you don't know anything about him. That's interesting. That's really, really interesting. And here's the response to this. They replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Can you not just see this back and forth? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, how about this? Now, this story comes to a conclusion with some verses that we didn't read at the beginning, but I want to read them now because they're so, so powerful. Verse 35. Verse 35. Jesus comes back into the story. And it says, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, found him, the blind man, he said, do you believe in the son of man? And the blind man naturally, because he doesn't know much, he says, who is he, sir? And the man said, 
or, and then Jesus said, or, or he said, who is he? Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus answered, ready? Write these words down, highlight them in your Bibles. He said, you have now seen him. I love this part because the man was blind, but now he could see and he's telling him what you're visually seeing is what you're spiritually enlightened to now. You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. In essence, Jesus said, take a look. I am the son of man. And the man said without hesitation, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. It was, it was that simple. He did not need any convincing. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who will see will become blind. Some Pharisees, they're still gathering around. They want to pick a fight with Jesus. They heard him, Jesus, say this and asked, what are we blind to? Are you saying that we're blind to Jesus? We're, we're the Pharisees. We're the people that know the law. You're telling us that we're blind too? And check out the response from Jesus. Key thought for us today. Jesus said this as they asked, are we blind too? He said, if you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Now, let me tell you what Jesus meant by that statement, because that's why it's the key idea. And I want everybody to lean forward, sit on the edge of your sofas and your lazy boys right now. now listen closely to me. This is what Jesus meant by that statement. He said, there are a lot of people in this world who think they can see. They've almost even convinced themselves that they can see. But they are spiritually blind. They're spiritually blind. Listen, friends. The only thing that a blind person knows is this. They can't see a thing. Can you just imagine, just try and imagine, maybe see a loved one, a friend, a coworker, a family member that doesn't know Jesus. They would be classified what we're saying as spiritually blind. Can you just try and imagine what those people in your life that are spiritually blind, what their life must be like? They can hear the words of Jesus. Some may be even listening to this message and watching it right now today. They can hear the words from the Bible, but they can't see their meaning. They can hear about the teachings of Jesus, but they can't see exactly the reason why he taught them. And lastly, hmm, they can hear about the pain that Jesus supposedly endured on the cross. And this is the greatest hiccup for them. But they cannot see why he went there for them. For a spiritually blind person Ready? Darkness. Darkness. It's all they know. Every single person that's in your life that does not know Jesus Christ, they're spiritually blind and darkness is all they know. But what if, what if your story of spiritual sight was all it took to change that spiritually blind person's life forever. What if? You ever wonder, since following Jesus, what your purpose is? Worship and glorify God. Make Jesus' name more famous by telling people about him. Share your spiritual story of sight to those who are spiritually blind.
Let me try and land this plane today. Please stay with me in closing. I'm almost done. I want to read a story of a friend of mine. I played college football with this guy. His name is Alex Bryan. He's 6'4", maybe 6'5", 320 pounds, and he's a pastor. Big dude. And he wrote something that I want to share with you today that maybe the light might go off for some of you. He wrote something, and he titled it A Really Bad Neighbor. He said, I moved into my neighborhood about five years ago. And across the street from me was a guy that I knew I wouldn't really jive with. He was older, didn't talk much, chain smoked, and had two big dogs that could eat any of my kids in a single bite that he frequently took walks with around the neighborhood. We just were at different points in our life. He was retired with no kids in the house. And you know how it is. Most retired people don't want to be around families with young kids. The kids would lose balls in their yard and just annoy them with, ever, with never ever uh, sending, sounding noise and chatter. He was an older white guy who probably doesn't approve of interracial marriages, which I am in one. And I could probably see him turning his nose up and thinking that his property value dropped because there's now a black man in the neighborhood with his white wife. He chain smoked cigarette after cigarette. So even when I tried to engage with him in conversation passing by, the smoke was just more than I could bear. I mean, who wants to be outside of your house and come back in smelling like smoke? He didn't talk much. So I didn't say much to him either. Then just before Christmas last year, I noticed he started to drop a lot of weight really fast. I thought in the back of my mind, this isn't good. I lost a grandmother to cancer and currently have two uncles battling cancer right now, all from chain smoking. But I didn't say anything to him. I mean, at this point, it would seem like I was being nosy, that it would be rude to start asking questions and pretend like I was all of a sudden interested in his life. So I said nothing. As the weeks progressed, I noticed he didn't walk the dogs anymore and wasn't working in his yard anymore. As a matter of fact, the only thing I would see him do is sit in a chair at the edge of the garage just watching people go by. And at that moment I knew I had to go and talk to him and say something. But after five years, how would I be received? Finally, about two weeks ago, I decided I need to pay him a visit. It was about 11 o'clock just before noon and I saw his garage light. I mean, it was about 11 o'clock at night and I saw his garage light on. And while I was taking out my gar garbage, I decided to go over and talk with him. It was very awkward because as I crossed the street and entered his yard, I realized, oh my gosh, I don't even know his name. I think I heard someone maybe call him Skip before, but I wasn't sure, so I had to wing it. I started with small talk, you know, nice weather, beautiful night, spring is here, but it wasn't long before I brought up the obvious. I said I hadn't seen him out much and it looked like he'd lost quite a bit of weight. So I asked him how his health was and he gave me the answer that I already knew, cancer, lung cancer, radiation, chemo, very little hope. And then it hit me. It was that moment that I realized between the two of us, there really was only one bad neighbor. I felt so ashamed and convicted as we sat there and talked while he openly revealed private details of his life as if we'd been friends for years. Not only was he extremely open, but he was very gracious and generous in excusing my poor efforts to ever reach out and be neighborly. We talked for about 30 minutes that night and I told him I wanted to pray for him before I left. I proudly exclaimed in that moment, you know, I am a pastor, as if that statement uh, assured him that my occupation gave my prayers, you know, a little bit more direct line to God or something. And he said, I know you're a pastor. And he smiled. Now I felt even more ashamed. Later, as that experience began to sink in, I thought back to a couple years ago when I read a book called Just Walk across the room by Bill Hybels. And in that book, he challenges each and every Christian to pray, to pray for and make attempts to witness to our neighbors and to win them to Christ. I can remember the words of that book like it was yesterday. 
I took initiative and I walked around my neighborhood and boldly prayed for many of my neighbors to come to know Jesus. You know, the ones that I thought might be ready to come to Jesus or open to Jesus. But ashamedly, this man wasn't even on my list. All this time, I'd stayed on my side of the street thinking that I lived next to a really bad neighbor. When in reality, the really bad neighbor was me. Friends, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 says this. All this is from God. Your gift of salvation is from God. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't do anything. It's a gift from God. And he reconciled you to him through Jesus Christ. And then don't miss this part because this is where we stop. Many of us as followers of Jesus stop. It says in the second part of that verse, and he, Jesus, gave us the same ministry of reconciliation. Never, ever, ever forget. You can't bring enemies to Jesus. They must first become your friends. You must build a bridge of love and then let Jesus walk across it through you. Please hear me in closing. If you're a born again believer in Jesus Christ, your story matters. If you've received God's wonderful free gift of grace, you do have something to say. Because of your salvation moment, you now possess a love that is worth sharing. Will you bow your heads at home? Close your eyes. Don't cut me off. I want to ask you, are you sharing your love? Are you sharing it? If at any time during this message today that you've realized you need some more assistance with knowing how and what you've heard, whether that be for prayer, whether that be for, I'd like to know more about that moment. What does it look like? Would you be willing to let us know right now? If you're watching from a Facebook watch uh, a party platform, simply just DM us or, or Facebook message us right now to the Church of Celebration Facebook page. Uh, just, just tell us, I need prayer. I'd like to know more about salvation. If you're watching from the open network platform, all you got to do is just push that live prayer button right now or, or push that button that says raise your hand for salvation. And we will have a prayer counselor follow up with you instantaneously today. We want you to know more about the questions that you have. And we will provide that for you. I want to thank you guys so much for joining us online today. Um, we're going to pray for you this week. And I'm excited. I hope you're excited. Next week, we're going to begin regathering again face-to-face -face on Sunday, August 23rd, 9 a.m. and 1045. If you feel comfortable, and if you don't feel comfortable just yet, or you find yourself in a higher risk category, don't panic. Stay home. That's fine. Online gathering worship experiences are here to stay at the same times, same formats, and same platforms. So you can join us next week as well. And we're going to start a brand new series that I think many of us, many of us need to hear. We're going to talk about relationship goals. And I'm excited to start this series. If you're married or you want to be married someday, you don't want to miss next week. I hope we will see you, some of you face to face and many of you also online. Let me pray for us in closing today. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for being a good and gracious God. Thank you, God, for giving me spiritual sight. Thank you, God, for giving and placing within me a love worth sharing. Thank you, Jesus. You've given us the ministry of reconciliation. Are we using that gift? That's the question I want people to think about as they leave today. Because every single person listening, Lord, I know has somebody in their life 
that does not know Jesus and their story of spiritual sight has the potential to change that person's life forever. Would you give them the boldness and the confidence, even if it's just simply saying, I don't know much, but here's what I know. I was blind, but now I see. We give you today in your son's precious and holy, holy, holy name. And all God's people said, type amens, praise Jesus. Thanks for joining us.
Amen, celebrators. Give him praise today. Yes. Our God is so good. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, make sure and come back next week. We'll see you.